<laughs> what? Okay. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Tatiana Show. And this is a very special edition. I'm very excited for our guest today. We have Andreas Antonopoulos, one of my first friends in Bitcoin and uh, also a great mentor or teacher or something or other. I don't know. A uh, great educator about the subject. We also have Josh Shigala, of course, from Voltoro. So welcome, gentlemen, to the show today. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me, Tatiana. It's really great to be here. Same here. Hey, Josh, how's it going? Are you psyched? Oh, I'm psyched. I've never been so excited. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's truly, uh, Andres, when you gave your speech at the uh, Canadian uh, uh, political roundtable regulatory body meeting. Yeah, it was the Senate. Yeah. The Senate, that's the one. Oh, man, I, I, I literally, that was every five minutes, I was just standing up and clapping. Oh, it's just extraordinary. You, you nailed it every question so beautifully and so elegantly um that uh yeah it was just uh flowing and you know we we ha we call this blockchain immutable and i would say thank god because we have andreas who is also immutable in a lot of ways oh thank you so much i actually have um a great team helped me prep for that um and did quite a lot of preparation for that particular uh talk uh, because it was quite important um, Andreas, a lot of your talks you do sort of off the cuff, or do you come up with the? I mean, everybody knows that you're, you know, one of the best speakers in the space and always really inspiring. So, how do you go about that? You know, do you have a plan before you start talking, or what do you? You have like an overarching theme, or how does yeah, that? Yeah, I, I usually have an overarching theme, uh, and in my head, I have three or four bullet points of what I want to say, and the rest is improvisational. It's um, it's off the cuff, and it, it really matters to have an audience so that I can play off the audience and get feedback as to what things they are enjoying and what things they're not. And you know, a lot of the stuff you don't see is that I have a lot of presentations that I do with smaller groups where I get to practice some of my material and <laughs> try it out and see what they like. Um, so it evolves over time. But yeah, it's, it's really all improvisational. So where have you been speaking lately, and do you think that the um, what what has changed since the beginning of your time speaking about Bitcoin to now, in your opinion? Well, the most recent thing is the conference we did together at um, La BitConf, uh, the Latin America Bitcoin conference in Mexico City, which was quite exciting. Uh, that was the last one from from uh, 2015. I'm about to go into heavy conference season. Um, I'm planning uh, visits across Europe uh, in March. Uh, I'm going to be in uh, Zurich for two conferences in March. And I'm also trying to arrange now to hit uh, three or four other European cities during that uh, tour. So I'm um, going to be visiting a, a bunch of local uh, groups and community meetups. Uh, after that, I'm heading out to Brazil in April. And it's just nonstop conferences until the end of uh, April. Is so there some way people can check uh, for dates and stuff? Do you have, uh, you know, a tour? Yeah, yeah tour once list? I have confirmed, uh, once I have confirmed dates, um, I post them on my website as well as uh, on Twitter. So there's an events page on my website, which I haven't updated because I haven't um, finalized the details here. Uh, but I will be posting uh, a lot of that information this week on my website and also on Twitter. Have you, um, you know, one of the things that is really great when you do the speech and, you know, when we were in Latin America, at, I'm sorry, in Mexico, I guess, I guess it's Latin America, um, you always bring up these key points, which I think speak to the essence of the core of Bitcoin's um, idealism, right? When you do a talk for bankers, how do you temper that in a way? Or do you, like, is that different for them? Do they leave there crying and saying, how are we going to rob people now? Um, how does that <laughs> go? Well, it's funny because um, I, I don't temper the message. I don't change the message in any way. In fact, if anything, it becomes a bit more pointed. Um, and... You know, my approach is to say what I'm going to say and then find the conferences or have the conferences find me that want that message. So um, recently I did a presentation in London that wired money. And the presentation basically consisted of telling them why uh, their attempts to do watered-down solutions with distributed ledgers and blockchains were basically bullshit. 
um, why um, identity and KYC and AML are dead ends and, and, and why Bitcoin is going to disrupt them and is the real thing. And their little sideshow of trying to do the blockchain good, Bitcoin bad isn't fooling anyone. Um, they loved it. Um, most of them loved it at least. It, was, it went down very well. And since then I've been invited to a bunch of other conferences to repeat that very message. So I, I think that's the best part of my job. I get paid to tell bankers that their um, their weak T blockchain bullshit is bullshit. And uh, I really enjoy that. Wow, it reminds me of when I've, sorry, Tadia, when I'm at the shopping center, the shopping center with these self-checkout people and there's one checkout chick left teaching people how to use the self-checkout system and I always feel slightly sorry for them. <laughs> um, so would you say that the people in the banks are aware that they are basically participating in a system that is fleecing mankind? Is that why they're so responsive? Do you think that they feel like they're doing something wrong? Do they want to do something right? I mean, do you think they have the same frustration that the rest of the population feels? I, you know, I think for the most part, uh, you, you've got to realize that there's a, a massive difference between individual motivation and institutional action. And, and what happens is most of these people are uh, really focused on um, having a job, paying their bills, getting their kids through school, um, making a living. Banks have been employers for uh, hundreds of thousands of people around the world. Uh, they're one of the few parts of uh, employment that that is still quite vibrant. Um, they've sucked the the they've sucked the breath out of every other part of the economy, but that that means that the best and brightest are still attracted to banks where they they get um, you know secure and plentiful um, employment. So most of the people working there really are just trying to do the best thing they can and they see what they're doing as serving people's financial needs and serving their customers. Uh, very few people within the banking system really conceive of, uh, you know, are the Wolf of Wall Street greedy uh, stereotypes you see on, in movies and I've worked with a lot of bankers and most of them are not sociopaths. Uh, of course, the sociopaths do end up getting promoted to some of the highest positions within the company. Um, and the, the problems really are institutional, however. It's, it's the fact that these organizations, having established themselves um, and aligned themselves with regulators and created cozy relationships with governments that feed these spheres of power and influence back and forth, uh, they're they're kind of stuck in this rot where what they do is what they do and the the whole thing has its momentum and individuals really don't matter or change anything. It's the institutions that are the problem and you know subverting those institutions is is what Bitcoin is all about. And I think like really it comes down to also that this 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 marriage between bank and state really is the issue as well. You know. Um, I mean, bank as a general concept is somewhere we, but you store your money. But when they really get in bed and they start building these uh, these these regulations around um, protectionism, crony capitalism, uh, uh, and and also um, bailouts, you know, where you privatize the profits and socialize the problems, um, that that's really where the the problem starts. And I think that's something that Bitcoin is really able to suck out. Uh, well, at least compete against so people have the choice to go, hey, well, I can take part in this crony capitalist system the bankers have set up um, or I can exit and just do something on the side. Uh, you know. Yeah, without a doubt. I mean, and, and that's simply a matter of historical perspective. 500 years ago, banking was a great liberalizing institution that actually opened financial uh, capabilities and services to people who were not part of the royal court. Uh, so before you had this type of what we would now call retail banking or consumer banking, um, only royalty uh, and the royal court had access to the types of financial instruments. They were the banks themselves effectively. And so the idea of taking banking and turning it into a a consumer oriented or retail business that serves uh, just normal people um, was a huge liberalizing influence and it took away a lot of the power of money from uh, kings and and royals and aristocrats. But um, 
you know, over time, any institution that that disrupts the status quo is eventually um, co-opted and merged and and turns into the status quo itself. Which is why um, having disruption in waves and and bringing a new wave of disruption every now and then is good for uh, society. So it's just now time to fix uh, banking with something that's that's absolutely more egalitarian. And who knows? Maybe in a hundred years we'll be talking about disrupting the ironclad grip of Bitcoin um, that has become a tool for the 1% with, with a more liberal system. We don't know how these things play out, but, but it's, it's ironic to think about the fact that it used to be the case in the 16th century that the only people who had checkbooks were the aristocracy, and banking brought checkbooks to everyone. You know, that's a great liberalizing force. Not anymore. So we fix it. Let me let me ask you something. When you talk about the you know the blockchain thing, right? I also find that annoying. However, I have also seen cases made for you know banks not being able to have that transparency, uh, not having control over it means that they won't be complying with regulations. So from a real world perspective, they have a difficult time being able to adopt Bitcoin, and then. Furthermore, you know, okay, well, if they have their private banking system, well, why is that bad? Should they not be able to do that? I mean, obviously, I doubt that they're going to pass the savings on to people. But aside from that, what would be the drawbacks from some of the smaller blockchains? Well, really, there's no drawback at all. I mean, you know, banks have their own internal systems that are highly centralized. And in those cases, a permissioned or distributed ledger is actually a great improvement over having an institutional clearance house that has control and front runs their friends' uh, trades and plays, um, plays games of advantage and power with, uh, with the rest of the market. Uh, so a blockchain actually is a better solution. Um, but you know we've got to realize the limitations these these things have, and part of the problem is that a blockchain that doesn't have decentralized proof of work uh, consensus behind it, or some kind of similar consensus algorithm that is decentralized and anonymous, um, it, it can be coerced and and it can also be rolled back. So you lose the immutability, you lose the fact that um, you can't change the blockchain after it's being recorded, uh, you can't roll back a hundred blocks and rewrite history. Uh, well, in permissioned ledgers, well, you can um, because it's based on signatures, not mining. So, so that's a disadvantage. It it also means there's a lot of other security problems that come with that. Now, is that better than what they currently have, which is highly centralized clearing systems? Probably, yeah. It's going to save them quite a bit of money, and it's going to change the way banking is done internally and make it more efficient. Um, that doesn't change the world. That doesn't change the relationship with the, between banking and state, between currency and people. Um, and Bitcoin does. Uh, it doesn't allow you to build an open, decentralized, global, transnational, transparent, permissionless, open innovation platform. And Bitcoin does. So uh, I'm going to stay focused on Bitcoin. Uh, that doesn't mean permission blockchains are bad. It just means that they're weak tea compared to the really, really, really disruptive and interesting thing. Just like if you have an intranet where you run your own private mail servers, uh, behind firewalls, that's yeah, it's it's useful. It's great for inside a corporate environment, and you have a wiki, and it's it's you can compare internal corporate information and transmit it. Great, but is an internet ever as interesting as the internet or Wikipedia or any of the open platforms we use? No, it's not. It's it's never going to be as interesting. It's never going to be as secure. It's never going to be as effective. So um, I I see these private blockchains as intranets. Um, and Bitcoin is the internet, and I'm much more interested in what happens on the internet. What do you think about um, some of the other projects, uh, crypto projects, like like an Ethereum or a Counterparty or something like that? Do you find them as compelling? Absolutely. Um, I think these are very compelling projects. Um, you know, I look at this as one giant evolutionary uh, space where different uh, different species of uh, currencies or blockchains and solutions compete, and I think they will find um, different environmental niches where they will fit well and provide great solutions for specific problems. Um, Bitcoin provides a very specific solution for the high security uh, global clearing network uh, for high value transactions um, with very robust proof of work security behind it. Um, Ethereum fits in a different niche. It provides the kind of contract based 
uh, stuff that uh, that perhaps Bitcoin can't do as flexibly because it has to have much more conservative and robust security. And there will be other niches. Um, there's plenty of space for many different species of cryptocurrency to exist. Uh, there's lots of little environmental niches where they will fit. I think eventually what we will see is that they will uh, interoperate very cleanly and we're seeing a lot of work towards that with side chains and, and various other innovations that allow us to tie these things together and, and make them collaborate quite nicely. So I don't see any of these as competitive. I see them all as very um, synergistic. Bitcoin opened the door to a world with many, many currencies, not just national monopolies that have the queen's face on them. And, and that world is going to be complex, it's going to be vibrant, and it's going to have a lot of competition. Do you think, um, you know, one thing that always was coming up in the early days uh, when, when alts, when there was just Litecoin and, and, and Namecoin, was the and then you you talk to some of these old gold bugs and they say, well, it's just uh, you know it, it's it's like uh, poppy fever or um, whatever it was called um, the where, tulip. Where, the tulip, yeah. tulip tulip sorry sorry right. the tulip so where where it expands uh, not through the one blockchain but by having hundreds of thousands if not millions of different blockchains from twenty one million tokens um, whole tokens uh, to infinite but uh, yeah do you think that uh, that changes now no, are we seeing the economic theory evolve I, I don't think it affects the scarcity the underlying sc scarcity of each individual currency I think um, is is provides the the right incentives within that within that system and within that uh, currency uh, whether we'll be able to exchange them for each other, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think this expansion of, of possibilities or competition among currencies is a bad thing at all. Uh, mm -hmm. Although we do have to recognize that what we've seen in the past, I think, will continue to be a fact, is that you, you will see a power law distribution of these things. 80 to 90 percent of the value will be in one, two, or three at most uh, currencies at the top, and then the rest of it will be shared by 10,000 currencies in a very long tail. Uh, many of which will have infinitesimal or marginal or no economic value whatsoever. They'll be used for other purposes or they'll have sentimental value or popularity value. Um, and, and that's okay. That You're going to have this long tail distribution as you have with many things that have a first mover advantage. Mm, I guess it's like, almost like having keys where you have hundreds of keys, that millions of keys could open certain doors with value behind them and certain doors with nothing. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, Andreas, I keep hearing about the block size debate, and I think that a lot of shows have covered this ad nauseum. However, I think of my show as the gateway to regular humans to understand a lot of this Bitcoin stuff, and you're really great at explaining this stuff. So, explain to me, who really has a much lesser understanding of the tech, what is all the fuss about, and why is everybody freaking out about Bitcoin? And uh, and you know, my current's like it's dead, because uh, that can be a little bit scary for people that are new to it. So, is there kind of a really basic level that you could explain what the debate is about? I, I think it's important first to to recognize why there is a debate and what it means to be having a debate in an open forum on an open source project and in an open currency and distributed system like this. Um, the truth is that people are not used to this kind of open debate, and the reason they're not used to this kind of open debate is because most of the decisions in other financial systems are made behind closed doors uh, by uh, a small number of people who then just announce their findings as if there was no debate whatsoever, and you get this authoritarian um, announcement, pronouncement, fiat if you like. Um, that, that comes from above and is very clean and polished and written by PR professionals. You know, when Janet Yellen makes her uh, Federal Reserve uh, uh, remarks, uh, those are very, very, very carefully rehearsed. Uh, every word has very special meaning. Um, and you don't see a lot of the kind of uh, nastiness that goes on behind the scenes, uh, which may be very heated debate. All of that's hidden. In Bitcoin, all of our laundry is out in the open. This so you, you get to not just see the sausage, you see the sausage making process and it's not very pretty. Uh, this is an open, vibrant uh, community with a lot of different opinions and these opinions don't get to make the other side shut up and they don't get to impose their opinion on the system because no one has enough control to override everybody and stop the debate. 
and as a result, um, because the system cannot be modified with uh, authoritarian control, and because it requires everyone to agree in order to be modified, these debates can rage on for a while until consensus is reached, and they happen in a very public and open manner. And other people will point to this and say, look, Bitcoin's a mess. Uh, that's not a mess. Uh, that's what an open community looks like. Hmm. And we've seen this hmm. in other open communities. We've seen it in Linux. We've seen it in uh, on the internet in the standards bodies uh, that made decisions about the internet and protocols like TCP/IP. If you want clean and sterile and antiseptic, you elect a dictator, and you will get a nice, clean, PR-proofed uh, decision. We don't have dictators in Bitcoin, so we get the full messiness of democracy. Um, and it's not even a democracy where the majority rules because it, it requires a very, very, very um, high level of consensus before anything happens. So even if half the people or 55% believe something, they still can't make it happen so easily on the network. Um, so that's first of all, we've got to realize that this messiness is part of what makes Bitcoin great. It's the fact the fact that we're not arriving at any decision is because it's difficult to make changes to Bitcoin without everyone agreeing, and that's one of the most important strengths that keeps Bitcoin from being um, subverted to political pressure, uh, to majority opinion, to a fad, to a popular sentiment. Uh, and switch from one position to another, it means that the principles in Bitcoin get maintained for much longer. So what's I, happening? I mean, the, the technical side... Sorry, Tatiana, go ahead. Well, because it just seems like we're barreling off into the abyss, and the, the way that it's kind of presented, the way that, you know, I'm, like, absorbing it, is that, oh, we're just... Bitcoin's going to fail tomorrow, you know, like, this block size thing needs to be solved right now. And I guess you're. Well, gonna Bitcoin's finish. been failing tomorrow since 2009. Uh, that should be a slogan yeah. we should put on the t shirt, right? Uh, imminent failure. Bitcoin's imminent failure, yeah. uh, imminently failing since 2009. Yeah, um, I call it the fainting goat of, of money now. Right. <laughs> so the, the, the bottom line here is that there's all of this whoa, it's going to blow up, it's never going to work, Bitcoin is going to die, Bitcoin's dead. Um, is Bitcoin dead.com or Bitcoin obituaries.com if you want to read about the other 92 times that Bitcoin died or to check if Bitcoin is currently dead. Um, you can use those <laughs> two websites. It's, it's quite a lot of fun. Um, seriously though, Bitcoin is resilient. It's very resilient to all of this drama and all of this um, fainting and vapors that everybody's getting. The bottom line is that uh, we're having a healthy debate about the future of Bitcoin. This debate is about a very careful balance between preserving the principles of scalability uh, and decentralization. It's about making sure that as we scale Bitcoin to meet uh, more demand, uh, which is really a reflection of success, we, we have a scaling problem because Bitcoin is growing and Bitcoin is growing because we're succeeding. Um, we need to, to meet that demand without changing Bitcoin in such a fundamental way that it uh, breaks the, the nature of decentralization and concentrates power in any one group. So um, even the groups that we thought had uh, quite a bit of power, the miners, the core developers, etc., it turns out they don't really have that much power because if they, if they did, then this debate would have been over. Instead, what we're seeing is uh, a plethora and diversity of opinions arising, and, and this is not getting easily resolved. However, we're also seeing uh, very specific technical measures. So behind all of this drama, technology is being done, engineering is being done, and this engineering has brought us things like segregated witness, which is a really brilliant scaling solution that at a stroke also solves three or four very fundamental issues that needed a solution. Um, we're seeing movements towards a carefully planned and executed hard fork um, that Core is planning. You know, a lot of people will say Core isn't planning a hard fork, but in fact, Core is in the middle of planning a hard fork and, and very carefully considering the implications of that. And we're seeing these plans unfold. Um, a, a lot of the drama that happened when... Uh, when Gavin and, and Mike Hearn introduced XT and then uh, Classic and other things like that has led to uh, a real debate and we're seeing some real movement in the technology too. So in a way, uh, they succeeded in getting this discussion pushed forward and we're seeing some real technical solutions coming out. I'm not worried at all. Bitcoin works today. It works perfectly well. 
Uh, a lot of the, the drama and fainting spells are really a lot of uh, drama over nothing, a storm in the teacup. Um, nobody's trying to destroy Bitcoin. All of the participants in this debate are, are doing so in good faith because of what they believe is the best way to move Bitcoin forward. And no one is able to impose their, their position on, on anybody else. Um, so, you know, I, I think we're in really good shape. We're actually seeing some very, very smart scaling solutions for Bitcoin that are going to allow Bitcoin to continue to grow in a way that is uh, effective and safe and consistent. Uh, and I think 2016 is going to be a fantastic year for innovation. I agree. Do you think, um, you know, Bitcoin governance moving forward has, uh, uh, do, do some of the solutions like segregated witness actually allow, because of the scripting being freed up, do you think there's going to be better ways of uh, Bitcoin governance moving forward? Um, for instance, Dash and stuff like that have, have developed interesting methods for, for governance and decision making. Um, do you think that's something that, that needs to be looked at or is being uh, part of this technical solution uh, that's being rolled out is, is going to look at some of these things? Um, yes, um, absolutely. I think we're seeing um, actually quite, a, quite a amazing developments in the area of governance, both in terms of the human and social aspects of governance. So, uh, for example, the core development team have massively improved in their uh, communications, uh, both tone and content. Um, we've seen the, the launch of new communication channels like BitcoinCore.org. Uh, we've seen better communication channels through Slack and the mailing lists, as well as uh, publishing of position points, memos, and FAQs that are uh, geared towards explaining things to the end user, not just in technical terms. Um, and that shows that uh, core developers are understanding the importance of communicating with a broad diversity of users and stakeholders in the Bitcoin space, and not just having the technical engineering discussion. Um, we're seeing also segregated witnesses opening the door, as you said, to some technical governance tools for uh, multiple parallel soft forks um, and improvements in Bitcoin that can be competitively tested on the network and uh, launched in parallel. That's going to accelerate development and innovation a lot. As for um, implementing governance techniques, uh, I, I know, I mean, Dash has some interesting ideas. Uh, but I think it's important to, to keep in mind that what can be done on a fairly small scale with non-contentious issues as is happening in Dash doesn't necessarily also work at a much bigger scale on a, on a, a massively bigger network with a lot more money at stake um, and a very different structure. So it's, it's, it's easy to prototype a solution uh, and then say, look, here it works. Uh, but th that doesn't necessarily mean that that same solution would work as easily uh, on something as big as as Bitcoin. So we have to we have to be a bit cautious. In, in Greek, we have this expression, which, which is uh, the one standing outside the dance circle always claims to be the best dancer. <laughs> nice, nice. That's that's me. Um. So. You know, people sometimes think, well, what if the government makes Bitcoin illegal? And obviously, they're kind of not able to do that. But they can make it difficult for people. Um, you know, if, if the government said, I don't like what Tatiana's saying, they could say, Coinbase, shut her down. Um, and I think that our, our environment is getting um, more intense and more government uh, control is being exerted. So other than, I guess, using these... Uh, more secure wallets. I mean, what would you say about people finding solutions to things like that? Well, I, I think it's important to remember that um, th that uh, government trying to make it difficult for Bitcoin people it ignores the possibility that the people who are most to benefit from Bitcoin already have it so difficult that you can't make it more difficult. So if you're a Chinese dissident or you're um, uh, an aid worker in Uganda, or you're um, a Kenyan farmer, or um, you're someone in Venezuela dealing with uh, a horribly corrupt government and collapsing uh, currency and hyperinflation and capital controls. Like, really, what are they going to do? Take away your bank account? Ah, don't have one. I don't have one, so how are you going to take away the bank account I don't have? I'm already in a cash and barter society, can't make it any worse. The real issue here is that Bitcoin is solving problems 
and, and will be solving problems and addresses the needs of, of people who have never had the nice cozy relationships with banking that we have in the first world. Um, and so therefore making it illegal, <laughs> everything's illegal in some of these countries. It wouldn't be the first or the last thing to be made illegal. Laughing's illegal too. Um, it doesn't matter. Uh, so the, the point is in the places where the rule of law matters, um, it's actually quite hard to make things like Bitcoin illegal. You can run interference, um, but, but that really isn't very effective. In places where the rule of law doesn't matter, you can make it illegal all day, uh, and people won't really care if it's made illegal. They'll just use it to bribe uh, the police officers and politicians, uh, as, as we've seen in the past. So, um, you know, the, the thing is that um, there's, there's the other side of this coin, which is that um, if you try to fight a, a kind of a battle of attrition against Bitcoin by making it harder, by trying to track things, by uh, trying to block things with block lists and blacklists and things like that, what you end up doing is you lead Bitcoin to evolve into becoming stealthier and more anonymous and more fungible uh, than it is today. So every action has an equal and opposite reaction. If you squash Napster, you get BitTorrent. Uh, and that evolutionary pressure is very strong. And keep in mind, Bitcoin is one among a thousand different cryptocurrencies, um, many of which are much, much more stealthy, much more anonymous, much uh, stronger privacy protections than Bitcoin. And Bitcoin can adopt a lot of those techniques. So in many ways, um, trying to disrupt Bitcoin uh, may have a kind of opposite effect by leading it to evolve into a stronger system. Uh, Anti-fragile systems do that. They respond to stimulus uh, with reaction. We saw that with Silk Road. Um, you know, it was a pretty tame market, really. Um, uh, it, it didn't, uh, you know, it had a lot of stuff banned and it was quite large. It had this network effect, so everyone was going there. As soon as the uh, it got shut down, we have some really horrific, uh, awful markets uh, pop up. Uh, so I've heard, um, uh, and and so you, I know what you're saying there. Once you squash something, you get unseen circumstances happening, of course. Uh, where you start to um, uh, see the evolution in different directions that you don't want. Uh, and that doesn't mean that governments won't do this. Uh, governments are, are are often very, very short-termist in their thinking, and they will play this game of whack-a-mole, even though each mole they whack creates a mole that's even worse, uh, even stronger, or whatever. Uh, they've been doing that um, in, in a number of areas uh, over many, many years, whether it's the copyright wars, whether it's uh, file sharing, uh, music and piracy and things like that, whether it's the war on drugs. Uh, all of these things where, you know, the cure is worse than the, the actual problem. Um, they will do that, uh, but, but it won't really matter. It won't have any effect. The whole point of network-centric money, uh, of systems that are dynamic and um, decentralized, is that applying pressure in one place simply uh, moves the activity to another place. Uh, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not so easy to stop. And so that's the redeeming feature and the strength of Bitcoin. So Bitcoin is now also the mole of money, folks. Yeah, absolutely. It's a whole lot of different animals, this beast. Um, so what do you think will happen with, um, I don't know, with our society as things go forward? Uh, you know, I mean, we're talking about the Silk Road. Uh, Ross is in prison now. Uh, things are sort of unfolding. I mean, do you think that there's going to be, I mean, look at the presidential elections here, if anybody even believes in that farce, which I'm not really too sure I do at this point. Um, what do you think that's, how do you think things are going to lay out? Is there a way to kind of help these people that have fallen victim to uh, to the government or these lost causes, or what do you think? Um, unfortunately, I think in many cases, um, it, it takes a very long time for uh, things to change or to change the better and um, it's frustratingly long and in the meantime there's a lot of minor and major injustice that happens at every scale. Uh, you know, uh, th the world is not a, a fair place, it's not a just place and bad things happen. Uh, Aaron Schwartz is dead and Dick Cheney is alive and uh, you know if that doesn't uh, make you uh, question the, the universe uh, and its justice, then uh, what will? So 
you, you just have to focus on, on what's important and what you can control. And what you can control is your own actions and your own choices. Um, and uh, use um, you know, the, the life you have and the time you have to work on things that you think are meaningful and will have a long-term impact. I think we are all blessed in a way to be in this space where we can actually apply our smarts and our creativity and our, our artistic talents uh, on something that we really see can have a long-term impact for, for justice and freedom in the world. Um, and Bitcoin is, is one such thing. So it, it's, let's just count ourselves as lucky that we have this focus and uh, purpose in our life. Um, and it's, it's, it's better to focus on that and not worry about the bigger picture because we don't control that. Definitely, definitely. Well said. Um, so I, I recently accepted the uh, position of running Liberty Fest New York in September. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I got into Bitcoin because I was so frustrated with the political process. I thought this is just a joke. This is never going to work. And I think that, you know, seeing what's happening this year is obviously supporting that uh, that theory. What I wanted to do was focus this um, Liberty Fest on liberty in the future and freedom in the future through alternate technologies. We've of course talked about Bitcoin and uh, cryptocurrencies in general and what they can do. Are there any other emerging technologies that you can think of that you're excited about that could help liberate people in the future? Well, yeah, I mean, I think the other, the other thing we have to consider is that we're um, essentially at the apex of a, a 25 year war um, on crypto. Uh, cryptography that uh, has been wage waged and raging between uh, various governments in the world and the people of the world who are using uh, encryption and security technology to protect their own privacy and independence and self-determination and freedom of expression. And, uh, you know, we, we, we've been fighting this for a while. I remember back in the 90s, I joined the EFF in the very early days and I was participating in many of the activities around um, the clipper chip and the ban on encryption that was attempted by the Clinton White House um, in the very early 90s. And we, we prevailed in that round, and that's why we have uh, fairly robust cryptography on the internet today. And gradually it's getting better. Bitcoin uh, is actually one of the most widespread systems for public key uh, cryptography in the world we've ever deployed. And by attaching uh, the use of keys to the security of your money, you have a very nice incentive system, uh, but those same keys can be used for communication and authentication and many other things. So I see us as, um, you know, on the cusp of a great revival of uh, cryptography and encryption technology for the first time in history. Uh, individuals have uh, devices on them that are fully encrypted. Um, that even the manufacturers can't open uh, that use end-to-end -end encryption technologies for communication that uh, no one can intercept or surveil. Um, and we're seeing, especially after the revelations by Edward Snowden, a great revival in the interests of privacy and, and cryptography. Uh, I think this is a battle that we can win. Um, and I, I think the, the, the other really great tools for freedom in our lifetime uh, are the use of cryptography for, for personal privacy and independence. Um, I would yeah. encourage people to, to, to investigate those things and to learn how to use cryptographic tools uh, to protect uh, their privacy. Um, we, we, are, we are getting uh, enormous progress in that. Interestingly, Bitcoin has uh, accelerated uh, the rate of research and innovation in that space, again, by tying its financial incentives. We've seen some incredible developments in, in cryptography because of Bitcoin. Uh, one example would be uh, ring signatures and confidential transactions. Uh, um, uh, Gregory Maxwell and Dr. Peter Wool uh, developed, uh, among others, um, you know, some some amazing things happening there. We're, we're seeing a great resurgence of research in homomorphic encryption, which is an incredibly powerful technology, and has made enormous progress in the last few years. So I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we're going to see some very interesting innovations in cryptography in my lifetime that, that will significantly change the world. And for those folks that, you know, say, oh, it's for terrorists and stuff. I mean, the, the, the tragic, disgusting terrorist attacks that happened in France 
all happened over SMS, unsecured SMSs. I mean, uh, and, and you can't tell me that those things aren't being watched already. Uh, so they didn't even catch them in the in the daylight. Um, uh, you know, it, I think people have to realize that uh, catching bad guys should be good old fashioned police work and not drag net surveillance over everybody. Well, I mean, it's it's more of a matter of practicality. We have not uh, ever been able to design a technology where we can choose that that technology can be used by good guys and not bad guys. And, um, you know, I'm an optimist. I think the good guys outnumber the bad guys by several uh, several orders of magnitude. And it's more important to put uh, effective, uh, useful tools in the hands of good people all around the world to help them improve their own lives, improve their own security, improve their own privacy, um, because those things matter. Those things are fundamental human rights. And uh, worrying about whether technology can also be used by bad guys uh, is not my concern uh, and, and is never going to be my concern because it's not important in the big scheme of things. Uh, criminals use cars, they use phones, they use shoes, they drink water. Um, we're not going to fix these things by banning shoes, water, cars, or telephones, and we're not going to fix them by banning encryption or making encryption weaker for the good people who need to use it. But um, it would be handy to be able to see if someone doesn't have shoes, then they're obviously a bad guy. I mean, that would be pretty handy, Andreas. I right. Well, it's I certainly going pretty... run away as fast, too, either. Yeah. I mean, so, it sounds like a pretty reasonable thing to ban. Well, what would you say to people that would say something like, um, well, I don't have anything to hide? You know, how do you counter that in a, in a conversation? Um, well, I, I think if you don't have anything to hide, then you are one of the privileged few who, who live in a place where they have a level of uh, freedom and control and independence that allows them to live their normal life without having anything to hide. And that's because um, many of the things that happen in your life are not illegal and because you don't live in an oppressive shithole. Um, but a lot of people do. Uh, billions of people do. Billions of people live in places where um, if you're a woman, you can't drive, you can't own property, um, you can't show an ankle without being arrested by the morality police, you can't speak against the Communist Party of your country without being labeled a dissident and at best uh, not be able to get a job and at worst being sent to a re-education gulag. Uh, those are realities of our world today. It's comfortable to be in a position where you can say, I have nothing to hide. Uh, but, uh, you know, I'm not concerned with building technology for people who have nothing interesting to say and therefore don't need free speech or, um, or nothing interesting uh, to think about and therefore don't need freedom of expression. Uh, I'm interested in, in, in building a world where everyone can say, uh, I have nothing to fear uh, and not just, uh, not just the people who are the most comfortable. Here, here. So, um, you know, originally I wanted to ask again, because this is something that I think reoccurs. You know, I think there are certain aspects of the community that are a little bit depressed because uh, the ideology is seemingly getting lost in the clamor to, to please the overlords. Um, is this something that you're concerned about? Do you think that that spirit is still alive and well, or do you think that it's a... Uh, more of an agnostic uh, technology that maybe shouldn't have been infused with that in the first place? What do you think about that? I, I think it's absolutely natural in the evolution of a technology as it becomes more and more mainstream that the core principles that birthed it become diluted. That's happened with every technology. Um, and that's happened with the internet, of course, but that doesn't mean that even though the original principles actually were uh, this week is the 20 year anniversary of John Perry Barlow's Declaration of Independence for Cyberspace. Uh, it's a fantastic monumental occasion. I remember reading that the day it came out. Um, and, uh, you know, wh where are we today? Does the Internet of today really express the, uh, the principles and, and idealism of those early days uh, the people like John Gilmore and John Perry Barlow and Mitch Kapoor and others who founded the FF and, and, and many others who were cyberpunks and cypherpunks who built the internet. Does the internet still express their idealism? Uh, no, but it did birth Bitcoin, so it's still full of surprises. <laughs> Even though it's uh, diluted and mainstream and Facebookized, it still can birth from within it. It's little surprises like Bitcoin that can shake the world to its foundation, so I'm always 
hopeful. And Bitcoin is going to get diluted. Its principles are going to get diluted. The good news is that Bitcoin started from a very, very strong ideological position. It created an ecosystem where even stronger ideological positions for freedom and privacy can be expressed. And it lives in an environment where it's actually difficult to change. Part of the reason we're having this block size debate is because a lot of people are very, very cautious about maintaining these basic foundational principles of Bitcoin. They disagree about the how, uh, but they don't disagree about the fact that these are really important principles to maintain. Uh, and that's because Bitcoin is hard to change, it gets diluted a lot slower. We're seeing all of these discussions and everybody's uh, very comfortable with this new fad, blockchain good, Bitcoin bad, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a silly little uh, jingle, um, and that's about the level of seriousness of this discussion. Um, but that hasn't changed Bitcoin. Um, what it's done is it's made a lot of consultants rich, and it's created a lot of consortia, and now we have altcoins that are not just backed by your local pump and dump scammer, but they're backed by a global multinational bank. Oh wait, same thing. Anyway, um, you know, the bottom line is that, that all of that hasn't changed Bitcoin fundamentally. It's still just as disruptive, it's still just as much a thorn in the side of those who would try to create monopolistic systems of capture and control. And it still brings with it a really strong promise of freedom. So I'm very optimistic that uh, we will continue to have uh, a great deal of freedom come out of Bitcoin. And when Bitcoin needs to be disrupted, we'll disrupt it with something else. Um, so I have a question. When I first got into Bitcoin and when I got into politics as well, you know, it's always been really important to me as a musician to use music to be the voice that can't always, um, you know, be heard because people have different interests. And I think that artists miss the miss out on their opportunity to use that voice to express um, ideas, and that's you know that that change society. So when I was trying to explain the artist coin concept, which I'm scaling now, I'm like helping other artists do it the other day with an artist, you know, I always thought I'm going to tell use this as a chance to talk about Bitcoin and why Bitcoin is so great, why Bitcoin is so revolutionary. But the artist was caught up on the word Bitcoin and he couldn't hear anything else that I was saying. So in the interest of bringing artists into crypto, um, talking about Bitcoin maybe wasn't the best thing. Do you think that there is an important part that I or others can play in terms of expressing that ideology behind Bitcoin? Um, I mean, or do you think that it's just going to get lost out there? Because on the one hand, there's a, there's it a desire it doesn't for mass matter. adoption. It doesn't matter what you call it. And it doesn't matter if you succumb to the pressure to use the uh, milder versions of the words and say blockchain but mean Bitcoin, it doesn't matter. I clearly remember a time when the internet was a, was a dirty word um, and until it became so unavoidably mainstream that nobody could really uh, continue with that discussion. Now people who consider the, the internet a, a, a dirty place uh, full of uh, heathens and, and perverts are at the fringe of the most fundamentalist religious sects and, uh, and conservatism, and, and we ridicule them. Uh, but I remember when that position was mainstream, um, and I think the same thing happens to Bitcoin. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, it doesn't need uh, the brand promoted. Um, the more people you meet who are just normal people who use Bitcoin, um, and, you know, they're a dentist and not a drug dealer, uh, you gradually realize that a lot of this propaganda is, is wrong. So um, I'm, I'm not really concerned. If, if you have to call it blockchain, if you have to talk about uh, uh, decentralization instead of putting the focus on, on Bitcoin, if the banks do permissioned ledgers, you know, what are they doing? They're funding developers and teaching them how to use distributed ledgers. Great! We got them to put millions of dollars to play on our turf. You know, a couple of years ago, we would have considered that a huge marketing coup and a great success. Um, they're training all of these developers. All of these developers are going to uh, do all of their little permission ledgers within the bank, and then they're going to realize and see quite clearly um, that there's, there, there's a global ledger out there that's far more interesting uh, 
uh, because it cuts across borders and it's not just a closed system for the banks. And they're probably going to take their Christmas bonus from the bank and use it to start a startup that disrupts the bank itself. Um, bring it on. Uh, go train people in blockchains. Talk about blockchains instead of Bitcoin. I don't think it hurts us one bit. But what about trying to, um, you know, I see all these different movements out there and everybody's like, feel the burn or Donald Trump and all this stuff. So I think that, you know, using the word Bitcoin or not, um, inserting that ideology into the expression, I think, is is something that I want to continue to do. But And I think is an important role in the world because nobody's talking about that. So that's why I'm averse to not, I mean, that's why I wanted to get involved with Bitcoin with my music was so I could tell people about, you know, the ideas behind it. It's not because I'm such a crypto nerd. I mean, I listen to that stuff. I'm going to kill myself. But I like the idea of getting people to understand this is a state issue. This is the banking system that's really oppressing you. It's not uh, along racial lines as much as it is uh, the power structure. So yeah, I guess well, that's I mean, my concern. The people who are ready to hear that message will hear that message and will be open to it. Um, a lot of people are not ready to hear that message. That doesn't mean you stop saying it. It, it depends on what audience you want to reach and, and what the purpose of you reaching that audience is. As you can see, I mean, I'm, I'm not shy at telling people exactly how uh, things are, in my opinion, and, uh, and doing that with any audience out there. Uh, but that necessarily means that a lot of people will tune out and not listen to what I have to say. That's okay, too. Um, there's room for lots of different voices in the space and each person needs to decide what audience they want to uh, address and, and what their main message is. Uh, so, you know, if, if your ma main message is, is freedom and the, and the power of decentralization and bringing down institutional structures of power, great, all power to you, bring that message to the world. Yeah, I think that the, the I mean, I don't really think I could water it down too much anyway, it's just not really in my character, but... Um... I think that people like to have somebody who stands for something. But at the same time, you know, when I think of music, I think of pop music, not because I love Britney Spears, but because I think of popular and trying to move the populace in, into a certain direction. It's always been something that it was important to me and made me so passionate about this. And that's why I think I get bummed out when I hear about, you know, the bankers and stuff. I mean, individually, I'm sure they're fine, but I certainly didn't get into this in order to help the banks. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I've been a geek since before geek was cool, so I don't know anything about populism. I'm used to being the unpopular kid throughout my entire life. Uh, it's only recently that being a geek uh, or nerd became popular. This is all new to me. I, I, I'm suspicious of populism. You know, populism is 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 what allows um, you know some of our politicians to be parading around celebrating war crimes and torture as exciting things and get applauded by idiots who haven't uh, you know thought about this issue for more than a few seconds. Uh, you know, populism in itself is quite dangerous, um, especially when it's combined with concentrated power. So I'm, I'm a bit suspicious of that, uh, but I understand what you're saying, and you're never going to be popular by uh, talking about things like um, like Bitcoin. So well, um, that's a bit of a conundrum. But what if you think about, you know, the Beatles, and they were popular, and Cat Stevens, he was popular. So I guess that's the that's the way that I mean. I think of music as being a a perfect counter to the propaganda, and that's why I think it's. You, been you've got to hijacked. remember. You've got to remember the truth of the history, though. Um, the Beatles were widely reviled among conservative uh, groups uh, here in the United States, um, and uh, you know, at at the time, you had people like uh, Nixon, for example, who were um, who were actively fighting the culture war and built an entire culture war apparatus against exactly that kind of youth movement. Um, and had utter disdain for their long hair and their revolutionary message and their um, and their um, sexualized rock and roll moves, which seems ridiculous to us today. Uh, but at the time, uh, the Beatles were not popular universally. Uh, they were considered corruptors of youth by a lot of people. I know that sounds really silly today, but but that is the truth. So you know, it's it it wasn't all it wasn't all parades and roses. No, I all want I, to corrupt them. All I generally see is this celebration of mediocrity when I when I think about pop culture currently, um, and I think something like uh, like cryptocurrency and Bitcoin to to break that barrier because it really is the opposite of mediocre. It's it's amazing. 
I disagree. Uh, I disagree. I'm sorry. Pop music in my days was controlled by six or seven recording studios that had enormous power and could tell you exactly who the latest pop artist you should follow was. And we had three genres of music, maybe four. And now you have 400 genres of music, hundreds of thousands of artists who have their own platforms to g get giant audiences on places like YouTube without any recording studios. And the gatekeepers can still push a lot of empty, um, you know, marketing dolls out there. Um, but music is so much more diverse, uh, so much more interesting, um, and so much more powerful today. And the artists are much more powerful today than they ever were compared to the studio. So I, I don't see it as a parade of mediocrity. Parade of mediocrity was when I was growing up in the 19... 80s, yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. And then we didn't have choice. We did, we had radio. <laughs> we didn't yeah, have any yeah. of this. Well, yeah, that's true. There's more choice, but I think it's a lot harder for artists right now to, you know, I mean, this is what I'm trying to solve. It's like, you know, you go on Facebook, you get all your fans on Facebook, and then Facebook charges you to reach them. And it's, you know, there are. Also, you know, like as an artist, you got to work a day job, and then you've got to work at night, and then you've got to be fit, and then you've got to work on your craft, and then you've got to gig. I mean, and now you have to manage your career. So I, I think that there are more opportunities, and, and definitely, yeah, that's great. Artists can record at home. They could do different things. But I don't think that we're quite there yet where an artist can create in a way where they're not working themselves like a dog and then burning themselves out. Like I think no, that there's without, still without a way to go. Yeah, absolutely. It's 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 certainly not there or you know easy to to be that. But I I mean I'm I'm just considering that in the past when I was growing out, all of these artists were completely invisible. Uh, they had absolutely no way of reaching an audience other than going to a local bar uh, and meeting people in person. So you know I think things are changing very rapidly, and the internet is part of what's changed that, and it's fantastic. And you know I, I, as we all believe, I think Bitcoin can add even more uh, to that. Um, to that change. Um, now, you uh, released a book, Mastering Bitcoin, uh, fantastic volume one. Now you're working on volume two. Um, when's that going to be released? How's that looking? Uh, is it still as crowdsourced? How's, how's the information getting sourced? Is it super technical or is it for the, for the new guy, girl? So Master, Mastering Bitcoin, uh, the first edition was published in December of uh, 2014. Um, it's now been just over a year since it's been out. It did very well. The book is for developers. It's for technical people. It explains how Bitcoin works uh, in uh, incredible detail and technical terms. Um, I'm currently working on the second edition. It's not a second volume. It's the second edition of the same book, um, which means that updating the content, uh, improving the content, as well as adding a lot of new content to it uh, to address many of the new things that have happened from payment channels and Lightning Network to segregated witness and reusable payment codes, uh, privacy protections, and things like that, as well as some of the behind the scenes technology. Uh, so the book is going to have all new content as well as improvements in the old content. I'm expecting to publish it around the summertime. Um, it's going to, again, be open uh, with an open source license. People will be able to read it and contribute uh, before it's printed. Uh, and then once it's printed, it will be free to read and share with others under a Creative Commons license, um, as well as available in, in print and ebook in, in booksellers worldwide. So um, working towards that right now, and uh, I think it will be a, a nice addition and, and helping people to understand some of the new technologies that have happened in Bitcoin. What do you think about a beginner's Bitcoin book? Are there any out there? Can you make one, please? Because <laughs> I know that you're just bored and waiting around for, a, for, a, for requests, but I mean, are there any things that you could send people to that are just starting out with Bitcoin? Well, um, I have some ideas about that, but I'm not going to talk about them on this show. So stay, stay posted. We'll see. Okay, good. Well, um, we're coming up on the hour now. And uh, what else are you up to? Where can people catch up with you? Is there anything else that you wanted to maybe talk about before we, before we go for the day? Um, well, as I mentioned earlier, I'm going to be uh, in March, I'm going to be in uh, Zurich, as well as uh, probably four other cities in Europe. Uh, so I'm going to be doing a little uh, tour in Europe uh, between March 17th and April 1st. 
And so I'll be making some announcements soon about that. Hopefully I can meet a lot of the uh, people in various cities in Europe that I haven't visited uh, yet. And um, it's going to be a busy conference season, so I'm going to be around. Um, I've also been updating my YouTube channel, uh, posting uh, some of the older videos, re republishing them um, under my own channel now. Uh, and so if you subscribe to that, you can see both new videos as they're coming out, as well as some of the old videos that uh, I think are well worth watching. Very cool. And Andreas, what's your website? Uh, my uh, my website is antonopoulos.com. My YouTube channel, you can find it very easily. It's A-A-N-T-O-N-O-P, which is also my Twitter handle, and uh, uh, that's what I use to communicate the most. Um, so we have, we also, we broadcast on liberty.me, but we also broadcast to um, LTB Network, and we wanted to know if you had a magic word or phrase for us today, for our listeners. Oh, I don't. I'm, perhaps I came unprepared. I do not have a magic word. You can just or, make it up. Uh, or, or phrase. <laughs> I know what the phrase is, and you're not going to like it because it will make you blush, but I'm going to have it anyway. Andreas is awesome. That's the oh. phrase for today. Thank, Thank you so you. much for joining us today. Josh, uh, tell people where to find you. Ah, well, Voltoro.com or Twitter, Volt at Voltoro. Um, you know, just just Google Josh Rishigala or All right. Voltoro. Great. So thank you, everyone, uh, at Let's Talk Bitcoin for listening in. Thank you to Liberty.me team for helping us put this together. Um, there will be some extra bonus episodes coming up, so I hope you enjoyed this one. Uh, check it out at um, TatianaMorose.com or CryptoMediaHub.com if you want to find out more about me. And I'll see you all soon. Peace out. Bye. Ciao.